Hi, this is Kelsey Fikowski for part two of our midterm review. And in part two, we are now looking at the four positions of Congress. And these are the four that you would take as a congressperson. And certainly you're going to gravitate towards one over the other. And for most congresspersons, you are going to be voting the way of the partisan, meaning you are voting the way of the party. And we see that particularly in the House of Representatives as opposed to the Senate. However, there are occasions where if you are in a mixed district where you have roughly 50 percent of uh, people being Democrats and 50 percent being Republicans and moderates and independents, you would be wise to go the way of the delegate. Now, one thing that's going to certainly impact the House of Representatives and not the Senate is, of course, gerrymandering. And recall that the census is taken every 10 years, and as a result, the Congress is going to have to engage in reapportionment, and thus then the, uh, the states will engage in redistricting. Remember that malapportionment is not allowed, and this comes out of Baker v. Carr. You cannot have one district having more people than another. And when I say more people, I'm not talking 10 or 100. I'm talking you know, tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands. And basically why this case is so darn important is because it establishes the one-man, one-vote principle. And ultimately, it also will allow for the courts to rule on gerrymandering. And this is going to be very important because it's going to utilize the Equal Protection Clause in the 14th Amendment. Now, interestingly enough, on the same side of this, the 14th Amendment, it's going to be used in a case of Shaw v. Reno. In this case, North Carolina was creating a majority-minority district to allow for the first African American to be uh, in Congress, and that was ruled to be unconstitutional. In this case, it violated the 14th Amendment to establish that race cannot be the primary factor when uh, drawing these lines, and that race really should not be taken into uh, consideration here. This was also found to be a violation of the Voting Rights Act of 1965 as well. Now, in terms of checks on, con on uh, Congress, certainly the president has a lot of checks here, vetoing power on legislation, appointments, and even negotiating treaties, uh, very important there. And then the judiciary, their t checks on the other two branches tend to be based on judicial review, and in that case, declaring a law of Congress to be unconstitutional. All right, so let's get into the presidency here. And some of the formal powers of the president as outlined in Article 2, they are roughly broadly defined, but over time we have seen the power of the presidency really expand. But uh, if we go right into Article 2, they are listed here that the, you should have an executive with limited power. However, we do know that that has expanded over time since the Great Depression. And certainly they are responsible for enforcing laws of Congress, handling foreign policy, being the chief executive and head of state, commander in chief with war powers, granting pardons and reprieves, and of course, reporting on the State of the Union. So certainly doesn't look all that impressive on paper, but remember, they have grown over time thanks to a lot of these informal powers. While, for example, during times of crises, we look to the president, such as in September 11th, to be the morale builder, as George W. Bush overwhelmingly was. But certainly they are the head of the political party. Uh, they are the crisis manager. They are, in many ways, a world leader. Again, not defined in our Constitution, but nevertheless, these are informal powers that the presidency has accumulated. And really where we see the growth of the power of the presidency comes with the executive orders. You don't need Congress. Uh, with the executive agreements, you don't need the Senate to ratify it. You have war powers with the commander in chief. The last time Congress has declared war, World War II. Executive privilege for privileged communication, veto power. Again, that is in the US Constitution, but just the mere threat of that can be enough to derail a bill. Even using the power of the bully pulpit in terms of persuasion, and then even signing statements on bills. So a lot of power there. Now, when we look at some of the cabinets that have evolved over time, we see the state, treasury, eventually the Department of War, which will be later known as the Department of Defense, uh, in 1947. Over time, we have seen that the president has advisors and they basically are going to have a specialized function and they are responsible for a certain area, typically of the economy or some as important aspect like Homeland Security that was added after September 11th. And along with these advisors, the president is part of the National Security Council, is part of the Council of Economic Advisors, and the Office of Management and Budget. Please look at these respective roles as, again, these are supposed to be advisors that help the president make important decisions in these policy areas. 
Now, amendments with respect to the president are pertinent to the 20th Amendment, and this is known as the lame duck amendment. The president used to get elected uh, in November, like we have, and the new president would not take office until March. So Congress is going to pass an amendment with the uh, remaining states, three-fourths of the state legislatures, and they're going to move that back to January 20th to prevent hasty decisions and to really narrow that six-month gap that you used to have, five to six-month gap there. Also, so you have the 22nd Amendment that limits the president to two terms and the 25th Amendment that defines presidential secession, especially in the event that a president is incapable or has some type of issue where the president cannot perform his or her duties. Now, very important in terms of our foundational document here is Federalist Number 70, and Hamilton is arguing for a single and strong executive in this Federalist paper, as opposed to the Articles of Confederation, which didn't even have a president. But certainly he's going to argue, adding accountability. Uh, uh, adding energy, also preventing legislative encroachments on presidential power, and then even being able to be flexible in terms of ener uh, emergencies and wars when they happen that you don't need to wait on Congress, which oftentimes can take a little bit longer, that the president can act with deliberate speed there. So Federal 70 basically trying to assuage some of the fears of the anti-federalists uh, in terms of having one president. Now, the president also has the power of the bully pulpit where there's all this attention, all this focus, and the president is going to be able to persuade the public for uh, specific policies. Usually, it is very effective. You're just one person. You're the face of government. And we see this, too, with respect to the State of the Union. And we also see this as more presidents have been using social media, particularly uh, President Trump with respect to being the Twitter-in-chief, using social media uh, to really – get out uh, messages and persuade the public for specific policies. Now, checks on the executive branch. Certainly, Congress has several confirmation power, overriding vetoes with two-thirds of Congress, power of the purse when it comes to spending, and even impeachment power. And then once again, the Supreme Court has that power of judicial review, a very, very important power where they can declare acts of the president to be unconstitutional. Now let's move on to the judiciary, and Federal 78 is going to deal with this particular branch. And essentially, what's going to be argued in this Federalist paper is that there's no power of the purse that the judiciary has. It doesn't have the power of the sword in terms of you know war powers. And it's supposed to be the least injurious to people's rights. It's supposed to be the least political, and we see that with respect to uh, no term limits. We will see that the use of judicial review will come out in the very, very important case of Marbury v. Madison. This is really what gives the Supreme Court its major powers. Remember, with the judiciary, they tend to utilize this principle of stare decisis in which they tend to adhere to past court decisions known as precedent. And then we also have the important safeguard on people's rights that's being argued in Federal 78, so they really have a lack of implementation, right? Uh, in, in that respect, they don't have the power of the sword nor the purse. So they can't stray too far away from popular opinion because they risk the president not implementing it, sort of like what we saw with Andrew Jackson in Worcester v. Georgia. And then uh, a big philosophy uh, debate between should justices be engaging in policy and if you believe that they should be correcting historical wrongs, for example, like we saw under the Warren court, you're going to be advocating more for judicial activism versus judicial restraint. You believe that really they should just be declaring an act constitutional or unconstitutional and really leave the policy making and the political decisions to the executive and legislative branches. Now, checks on the Supreme Court. Congress has a number of them here. Uh, they can certainly modify uh, the impact based on uh, past uh, leg or they could pass new legislation uh, based on prior SCOTUS decisions. You can even pass an amendment uh, that, of course, will take two-thirds of Congress and then three-fourths of the states. You'll also recall that judicial appointments have to be uh, first uh, nominated by the president and then confirmed by the Senate. And even again, the presidents and states can ignore decisions. We saw that even in Brown v. Board of Education, there were still states that were practicing segregation even years after that important ruling. Ultimately, too, if Congress wants to, it can alternate or I'm sorry, alter the jurisdiction of the types of cases that the Supreme Court is allowed and not allowed to hear. So certainly a lot there. Now, let's move into the bureaucracy, which is often known as the fourth branch of government. And this technically falls under the executive branch, but certainly there are 15 cabinets, as we talked about. We also have what we call regulatory agencies. They regulate a specific sector of the economy. For example, the Securities and Exchange Commission, the SEC. 
SEC regulates the stock market. We also have government corporations that make money and they charge for service. Good example of this, Amtrak. You take the train, you pay money, hence the government is running this particular corporation. And then we have independent executive agencies where they don't fit anywhere else. They aren't making regulations on the economy. They're not really making money. They're just sort of independent of themselves. They fit nowhere. And that's where you put things like NASA. Okay. So the role of bureaucracy is simply to be the action figures of government. They are implementing government policy here. And the regulators, for example, such as the SEC, would write fines. They would enforce regulations on the stock market or the FAA, you know, writing fines if you disobey a flight attendant, for example. And they are ultimately part of issue networks and triangles as they are competing and working alongside, for example, congressional subcommittees, as well as interest groups. And keep in mind that the important role here of civil, civil service, that to get into the bureaucracy and get promoted, that it's based on merit, not appointments based because they were loyal to you, like we saw with Andrew Jackson and the spoil system. Now, some of the major checks on the bureaucracy, discretionary authority. Certainly, uh, this depends on how specific the legislation is going to be. Is a bureau bureaucratic agency going to have a lot of latitude? Well, that depends on Congress and the legislation passed. But Congress is going to have the power of the purse, as we know. They can abolish an agency. They can certainly engage in legislative oversight where they bring in the bureaucratic agency and they grill them in front of Congress. They are also responsible for confirming appointments to the bureaucracy. Now, the executive branch, on the other hand, can pass executive orders uh, based on the president's ideology. And once again, appointments to the bureaucracy are very, very important. So you do see a number of checks on the bureaucracy, not to mention, too, the judicial branch with respect to judicial review. All right, let's move into our final unit of midterm review, unit three. And this is where we're talking about civil liberties and civil rights. So we see civil liberties, and we're, when we talk about that, we're talking about individual rights. Uh, these are protected guarantees and freedoms that protect citizens, their opinions, their property against government interference. Versus civil rights, we're talking about group rights, that there are certain groups that have been left behind based on discrimination oftentimes. Uh, and as a result, the government is trying to create equal uh, conditions for this. For example, with respect to the civil rights movement in the 1960s, we see a number of pieces of legislation that are geared towards helping advance black rights and catch them up to, uh, for example, their white counterparts. What's very important for liberties and rights here, the Bill of Rights. These spell out very important basic liberties such as freedom of religion and speech. And it's important to know that originally the Bill of Rights did not pertain to the states. They have to be what's called selectively incorporated one by one by the Supreme Court to then pertain to all 50 states. It was often assumed originally by the founding fathers and the framers that the states would have their own Bill of Rights and would have this built into their own state constitutions, but not every single state did. All right, so let's first start off with freedom of religion. And in freedom of religion, there are two important clauses here. The first one being the establishment clause, which is meant to prevent a nation uh, or national religion. And this comes from sort of Jefferson's thought of the wall of separation between church and state. And the foundational Supreme Court case that is very important to know, Engel v. Vital, is basically saying that recitations of prayers and Bible passages are unconstitutional. This violates the Establishment Clause. However, students can pray silently, though, but government should not be getting involved with religion, particularly in schools. We also have what's called the Free Exercise Clause, which prohibits the government from interfering with people's practice of religion. Good example here is in Wisconsin v. Yoder, 1972. It's customary in the Amish community that there's no education beyond the eighth grade, but states have laws saying that you have to remain in school until a certain age. Well, it's going to uphold that Amish parents do not have to formally educate their children beyond the eighth uh, grade simply because this is part of their religion, hence the free exercise clause that the government should not be interfering with the Amish community. So very interesting how SCOTUS is going to be ruling in these two cases. And an example of this, too, is a giant cross in uh, Maryland, and this is on public property, and this was uh, here to commemorate World War I. Uh, veterans. And ultimately, this goes to the Supreme Court only a couple of years ago. And the Supreme Court is going to rule that this is not a violation of the Establishment Clause, since it is more part of history commemorating World War I 
veterans. Okay, when we come back, we'll finish up with civil rights and liberties in part three.